Okay, I'm gonna broadcast. Okay. Good evening and thank you for joining us on the second of our Friday evening lecture series for 2020. We're going to go live in a few minutes. Uh, we'll just wait for um, our attendees to start arriving. Remember that as you're joining us and as you're listening to the talk, you can submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of um, the page of your window. Uh, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of our talk. If you're just joining us, you can submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your window and we will answer them at the conclusion of this evening's lecture. We'll be getting started in just another minute or so. Um, please remember that you can submit questions at the bottom of the page in the Q&A section and we will answer them at the conclusion of our lecture this evening. And if you're just joining us, we'll be getting started in just another couple of seconds. Please remember that you can submit questions uh, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your window, and um, we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible at the conclusion of this talk. And let us know where you're asking your questions. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to tonight's Friday evening lecture. I'm Neepan Patel, director of the Marine Biological Laboratory. The MBL is dedicated to fundamental biological discoveries that inform human health and the health of our planet. Every summer since its founding in 1888, the MBL has hosted public evening lectures where renowned scientists, historians, and architects of modern biology have presented stunning scientific discoveries for exploration and discussion. Despite the hardships of the war years and the Great Depression, the Friday evening lectures have always been held without interruption. Just as our predecessors did, we are coming together as a community to adapt this year's series with stream lectures delivered by notable Friday evening lecture alumni. While I regret that we can't be together in person in the Lilly Auditorium, your presence here tonight is helping us to keep this important tradition alive. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the presentation. And remember to turn off your cell phones. Good evening. My name is Felix Schweitzer. 
I am a trustee of the Grass Foundation, and it is a pleasure to present the foundation this evening in welcoming you to the 61st, 61st Forbes Lecture, which will be given by Dr. Jared Diamond. The Forbes Lectures are sponsored by the Grass Foundation, which, as you know, has a long history of supporting research and education in neuroscience, especially at the Marine Biological Laboratory. The foundation was started by Ellen and Albert Grass with proceeds from the EEG machines that they had invented and commercialized through the Grass Instruments Company. Here you can see a picture of the two founders of the Grass Foundation and one of the very first machines that was being sold by the Grass Instruments Company. A major program supported by the foundation is the Grass Fellowship Program, which as so many things this year, only has a virtual component. But I'm happy to report that the 2020 fellows are very active in regular Zoom meetings, and we hope that the scientific and social connections formed will stay vibrant during the coming decades, as it has for so many previous Grass Fellows. The first Forbes lecture was given by Alexander Forbes himself in 1959. Forbes was a fund founding trustee of the foundation. He was born near Boston and, a grand and was a grandson of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He received his bachelor's, master's, and medical degrees from Harvard University, and then spent some time in England together with uh, Sir Charles Sherrington, where he was introduced into electrophysiology. When he returned to United States, he joined Harvard as a faculty member for the remainder of his academic uh, career. Dr. Forbes was one of the very first neurophysiologists in the United States. He is credited with recording the first neuronal action potential in 1915. He also joined the Needles Work Society, uh, which the group of electrophysiologists that worked together at Harvard during these times was called in reference to the sew sewing needles uh, that they were using at these times to make uh, electrophysiological recordings. I'd now like to introduce our 2020 Forbes lecturer, Dr. Jared Diamond, although I feel he barely needs an introduction. Like Alexander Forbes, Dr. Diamond was born in Boston and first trained at Harvard University. He then went to England, where he earned a PhD from Cambridge. Upon graduation, he returned to the United States, initially, like Alexander Forbes, back to Harvard. But then he moved to the West and joined UCLA. He was first a professor in the Department of Physiology and the School of Medicine, and later switched until now to the Department of Geography in the college. Dr. Diamond's earlier research was focused on nutrient transport across biological membranes, in, especially with relationship to digestion. But he also had always had a keen sense for ecology and ornithology, which led him in the 80s to discover the natural habitat of the yellow-fronted bowerbird in the remote mountainous area of New Guinea. Up to this time, only feathers were known of this particular bird since its habitat is in two remote areas to explore by mere humans. And his, his research extends into the influence of human societies on their environment and vice versa. Dr. Diamond is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and serves as a board member for the Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund. Uh, he won many prestigious awards, including the MacArthur Award and the National Medal of Science, which was bestowed up here, uh, to him by President Clinton. Besides hundreds of scientific uh, articles, he authored eight books as accessible to the general public, most notable Guns, Germs, and Steel, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent book is called Upheaval, How Nations Cope with Crises and Change. It explores resilience and crises at the level of nations and compares it to those crises at the level of individuals. The global crisis of COVID-19, as well as our never-ending racial exploitations, make the subject even more timely than it was a year ago when the book was published. Please welcome Dr. Jared Diamond. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be back at the MBL, even if it's only electronically, after more than 60 years. 
this return visit calls back old memories for me and probably for most of you as well. Let's begin with the happy memories. In the summer of 1957, I spent the summer at the MBL taking the invertebrate zoology course, which was the closest approach to pure pleasure in my educational career. That course was taught by John Buck and Howard Schneiderman. We went through the invertebrates phylum by phylum. We began in the early morning with a lecture. Then we went out into the field, into the ocean, to see where the animals lived, observed their ecology, collected them, brought them back to the laboratory, studied their behavior in the lab, poked them and examined their physiology, dissected them to study their anatomy, and finally in the evening, we cooked them and attempted to eat them. The course was an experience of pure pleasure, pure educational pleasure. It was not just a course in methods that would be out of date within a short time. It was a lifetime's worth of ideas and potential projects. I remember, for example, the animals called tunicates, whose blood pigment contained vanadium. Why on earth, instead of iron, is there an animal whose blood pigment is based on vanadium? And then I remember the ribbon worms, the nematine worms, with a poisonous poison stylus in their head, but inside their brain were a couple of spare poison styluses, and we couldn't figure out how the animal managed to change its poison stylus. Those are my happy memories from 60 years ago. Then, of course, given what's going on today, to give a memorial lecture now is an occasion for unhappy memories. Each of us, I'm sure that all of you, has had unhappy memories of recent deaths, the deaths of friends, friends from, in my case, 50 or 60 years. In the last two months, my wife and I have lost six of our friends whom we've known for 50 or 60 years. And those long relationships are irreplaceable. They died of COVID, they died of other causes, they died of who knows what, but I'm sure that all of you have suffered from these deaths, these memories of deaths, and some of our friends will also have been friends of yours. Our recent losses include, on June 15th, Kirk Smith of Berkeley. Before that, Bob May of Oxford, Don Kennedy of Stanford, Donata Ortler of Wisconsin. Many of you will have known them. Many of you will have known other people, these losses. COVID has produced a pulse of deaths, and this pulse is going to continue. There are going to be more of these tragic memories. But this crisis is an opportunity to change the world for the better. When I say that, your first reaction, my first reaction is, what an obscene thought to suggest that there might be anything good coming out of this tragedy of COVID. But think what the world is going to be like next year when probably we've got a vaccine. How may COVID have changed us then? I'm interested in crises, not just COVID, but other crises. I'm interested in national crises. And my recent book, Upheaval, published a year ago, May, um, was on national crises. Why? Because when I think back on my life, my experiences included living in countries that were going through or had just gone through or were about to go through or in the run-up to national crises around the time of my visit. For example, I was living in Germany on the day of 1961, August, when the Berlin Wall was erected. I was living in Chile during the run-up to the 1973 coup d'etat, when the military with Pinochet took over 
and the democratically elected president, Salvador Allende, shot himself. I began working in Indonesia in the aftermath of the Indonesian genocide of 1965, when Indonesians killed half a million Indonesians. I visited Finland for the first time in the aftermath of Finland's winter war against the Soviet Union, when my Finnish hosts were the veterans and the orphans and the widows of the winter war. And I began visiting Australia in 1964, just as Australia was starting to come to grips with its legacy of its white Australia policy. So those are the national crises that have been part of my life. Each of them is a gut-wrenching crisis in its own way, but one can ask, is there anything to learn from these crises, these national crises? My approach to history is, has always been a comparative approach. I don't write books about late 19th century Germany. I write books about, I study the comparison of different countries because from comparisons, questions arise and lessons emerge that you would never get from studying just a single country. And so there's a quip among historians. The historian who studies just a single society ends up understanding no society. Well, one may think, does correlation prove causation? Is it the case that Jared Diamond's living in a country provokes a crisis? No, that's not the case. It's instead the case that national crises are common. Any country that you spend much time in is likely to have experienced or be coming out of a national crisis. One may again say, well, there are so many books on national crisis, so many studies of national crises. What do we need a new book on national crises? What's going to be new about this study? Well, I'm looking at national crises from a new perspective, from the perspective of the personal crises that affect all of us in our personal lives. All of you, I'm sure, has had experience of a personal crisis that made you throw into doubt your own identity. Personal crises include especially breakdown of a marriage or of a close relationship. A personal crisis may in, in, involve the death of a loved one that makes you doubt the justice of the world. A personal crisis may be provoked by a job disaster or a health setback for you. All of you, like me, I'm sure, have gone through these personal crises that make you doubt yourself and how you've been operating. Well, I'm interested in personal crises, obviously because of my own, I've had my own share of them, but also because my wife, Marie, is a clinical psychologist who during the first year of our marriage was doing a special training, specialty training, in the area of psychotherapy called crisis therapy. Crisis therapy is different from the usual long-term psychotherapy when you meet with a counselor or a therapist for several years, every week, a couple of times a week for years, and you have the time and the leisure to examine early childhood events and their consequences for you. In, in contrast, in crisis therapy, someone has had a crisis that makes them doubt themselves, and the therapist has to help the client fast because in the worst case, there's the risk of suicide. So Marie in this year of specialty training, Marie and her fellow therapists um, would meet with the clients once a week for only six weeks, and you have six weeks to help the client figure out what's gone wrong and try to help them find a new way of approaching life. Each week, Marie and her fellow therapists got together and discussed all the clients in the office and discussed who is dealing well with their crisis, who's having problems with their crisis, what are the outcome predictors, what are the things that make it more or less likely that a person will succeed in overcoming a personal crisis. These outcome predictors are things that I'm sure are familiar to all of you from your personal experience, from your own crises, or from watching the crises of your friends. And as Marie, at the end of each week, talk to me about the outcome predictors that she had seen 
for people in dealing with personal crises, I realized, I think similar factors apply to the outcomes of national crises. Of course, there are differences between national crises and personal crises. National crises have leaders, they have issues and group interactions, so there are differences. But nevertheless, as you'll see, many factors that apply to personal crises apply straightforwardly to national crises. And other outcome predictors for personal crises suggest related outcome predictors for national crises. What are some of these outcome predictors that will be familiar to you from your experience or the experience of your friends? Outcome predictors for dealing with, with personal crises. As you know, the first step in dealing with a personal crisis is to acknowledge that you're in a crisis. If you don't acknowledge the crisis, you'll get nowheres towards resolving it. And similarly with countries, some countries acknowledge their crisis and make progress and some, some countries refuse to acknowledge their crisis. The United States has been kicking and screaming about acknowledging a COVID crisis now, whereas Vietnam acknowledged the COVID crisis immediately, launched measures and the result, almost no deaths in Vietnam. Again, you know from experience that an important factor in dealing with a personal crisis is to accept responsibility, to recognize that you have to do something about it. It won't do just to say, oh, poor me, this crisis was caused by all these bad people. Yes, there are bad people out there, but unless you figure out what you're going to do to deal with those people, unless you accept responsibility for doing something, you will get nowhere towards resolving the personal crisis. And again, nations have to accept responsibility for resolving a national crisis. Just think of the difference between Germany after World War I and Germany after World War II. After World War I, Germany denied responsibility. The Germans sought the blame for their defeat in World War I on traitors within Germany or on other countries. The result, no progress towards resolving the problems that had plunged Germany into World War I, and Germany ended up in the disaster of World War II. Whereas after World War II, the Germans acknowledged responsibility for the mess that they had caused themselves, for the disaster, that they had caused other, pe other people. They recognized their responsibility for Nazism, and Germany has made great progress in dealing with the legacies of World War II as a result of accepting responsibility. Again, you know from your own experience in dealing with crises, the essence of resolving a crisis is to adopt selective change. You don't throw away everything about yourself. You figure out what about yourself is not working and has to be changed, and what about yourself is okay and doesn't need changing. And similarly, countries in a national crisis have to adopt selective change. They have to figure out what needs changing and what's okay about the country. An example being the selective changes of Japan during the Meiji era that I'll talk more about. You know from your own experience that in resolving a personal crisis, it's of great value to be able to get help from friends, emotional help or material help. And it's important to be able to look to friends for models for resolving a similar problem. If your marriage is in difficulty, it may help you to see how friends resolve their own marital difficulties. And similarly, countries may get help or they may not, not get help from allies, and they may look to other countries for models or they may refuse to look to other countries for models. You know from your own experience that to resolve a personal crisis, you have to be honest with yourself. Honesty is lacking in some countries today in their dealing with COVID. And then again, you know from your own experience that important dealing with the crisis is the confidence that you may have gained from dealing with previous crises. If you've resolved previous personal crises, then when it comes to a new crisis, you may tell yourself, well, I got through a previous crisis. This one, I'll somehow get through this one. That's why the crises that befall young people teenagers and people in their 20s are so difficult because young people don't have the previous experience and the confidence that comes from that previous experience of having gotten through a personal crisis. Similarly, for nations, nations gain confidence from dealing with a national crisis. Britain from dealing with the Battle of Britain in 1940, Finland from dealing with the legacy of the Winter War. After those crises, the British and the Finns told themselves, 
we got through 1940. Nothing could have been worse from that. That gives us confidence that we'll be able to deal with this new crisis, whatever it is. But all of that is, is abstract. Let me give you a specific example of a national crisis. It's one of the most striking examples of the modern world of a country that succeeded in resolving a national crisis. And that was Japan in the Meiji era. That's the era in Japan that began in 1853, when after Japan had been isolated from the outside world for two centuries, during which Japanese did not travel abroad and the Japanese did not admit visitors from abroad. Those two centuries of isolation, of f isolation enforced by the Japanese government were ended by the uninvited arrival of an American fleet of warships under, under Commodore Perry, demanding that Japan sign a treaty for looking after shipwrecked American sailors in a, in a trade agreement. And the Japanese recognized that their policy of isolation was no longer going to work. They had to change fast or Japan would face the fate of China and be overwhelmed by the West. Japan succeeded in resolving this crisis. Why? Because it began by acknowledging the crisis. Rather quickly, Western bombardments of two Japanese ports convinced the Japanese that they were not capable of resisting the West until they had adopted change. They acknowledged that there was a crisis. The Japanese accepted responsibility. They recognized that they had to change and they did not fall victim to self-pity and blaming of the West, but they acknowledged responsibility for changing. Japan adopted selective change massively, the most striking example of selective change in the modern world. Some things about Japan were retained unchanged. Japan retained its emperor. Japan retained its wonderful writing system, kanji. But other things changed. Japan changed its form of government adopted a cabinet government, adopted parliamentary government, it adopted a national system of education, it adopted a fleet and army on the Western model, it changed its courts following the Western model. So Japan was a massive example of selective change that leave Japan today as a hybrid company, hybrid country, traditional Japan mixed with a modern industrial country. Japan is an example of honest self-appraisal. Japan embarked on a program of military and territorial expansion cautiously at every step, honestly appraising what they were capable of doing or what they were not capable of doing. In contrast to the failure of honest self-appraisal in Japan in the 1930s that plunged Japan into a World War II that they could never win. And finally, Japan was helped in dealing with its national crisis by a strong national identity. But you know from your own experience, from watching your friend, that it's important in resolving a personal crisis to have a sense of yourself, a strong personal identity, just as Japan had a strong national identity. So there's an example of a country that dealt successfully with a national crisis. And the result was that Japan between 1853 and 1910 underwent a massive program of westernization, strengthened itself, built up its military, and was able to fight off the West, was able to, to fight a series of wars against China, and then against Russia, and finally against colonial Germany and win those wars as a result of successful selective change. That then is example, an example of a national crisis that was resolved successfully for Japan, at least as of 1910. Let's now take an example close to home for us, for us Americans, of the crisis that the United States is facing today. As you may have noticed, the United States had big problems today. What are the problems that we face? Perhaps our biggest problems include our problem of political polarization, the breakdown of compromise between our parties and within our compromise, within our parties, the breakdown of compromise between our executive and legislature and judiciary, the breakdown of compromise between our national government and our states, that political polarization, that end of compromise that's the essence of a democracy. The United States 
also faces a big problem from restrictions on voting. Many Americans who would like to vote are prevented from voting, but voting is the essence of a democracy. So the restrictions on registering for vote threaten the United States with the end of an our effective democracy. The United States faces big problems from inequality. We think of ourselves as a country where rags to riches is possible, where someone who's born or rise poor can work their way up through ability and hard work to achieve riches. In fact, the United States is the most unequal country, the country with the biggest differences between lots of poor people and a few very rich people among all major democracies. And the United States has the lowest socioeconomic mobility among major democracies. In the US, it's not easier. It's harder for poor Americans to end up rich than in any other major democracy. Finally, the US is suffering today from a problem of low government investment in public goods such as education and health. And now we are facing the COVID crisis. Well, how is the United States doing at dealing with its national crises. How do the predictors of my wife, Marie, derived from personal crises, apply to the current national crises of the United States? There are some troublesome signs. Accepting responsibility is essential for dealing with a personal crisis and a national crisis. But in the United States, there's widespread denial of responsibility for America's problems, especially at the level of our national leadership. Instead, our national leadership is inclined to blame America's problems on China or on Mexico or on Canada. But the United States' problems are caused by the United States. No one can end democracy in the United States except for us Americans. And so denying responsibility will get us nowhere. Another poor predictor for a happy outcome in the United States is our refusal to learn from models of other countries. Major Japan learned from Britain and France and Germany and the United States about education and military and, and government. But the United States has a fascination with American exceptionalism. The belief that the United States is so exceptional, that there's nothing that we can learn from other countries. And yes, the United States is exceptional but Uruguay is exceptional, and Uzbekistan is exceptional, Ultra Volta is exceptional. The United States faces problems, problems of education and health and voter registration that other countries face, that our neighbor Canada faces, that Western European countries face, Japan, Australia, other democracies face, and resolve to the satisfaction of their citizens much more happily than the United States resolves these same problems. We are unnecessarily spinning our wheels by refusing to learn from our neighbor, Canada, and from Western Europe. So those are some examples of national crises, national crisis that Japan went through, and the national crisis of the United States is undergoing now. And those are also examples of how outcome predictors from personal crises can help us understand the outcomes of national crises. Let's now go on for the final part of my talk. Since we've been talking about these heavy, painful things, now personal crises and national crises, let's now turn to a lighter subject, the problems of the whole world today. As you may have noticed, the world faces problems, including COVID. What is unique about the world problem of COVID? COVID is the first widely acknowledged global problem. It's not the first global problem, but it's the first time in world history that the whole world is recognizing that there is a global problem affecting the whole world. And the world is being forced to recognize that this is a global problem, COVID, that requires a global solution. COVID cannot be solved one country at a time. If the United States solves the problem of COVID within its boundaries, but the world does not solve the problem of COVID, the United States is just going to get reinfected by other countries. So COVID is a global problem 
requiring a global solution. COVID is not our first global problem. I'll remind you of other big global problems, but COVID is perhaps the first global problem that is widely recognized as a global problem demanding a global solution. Why is it that COVID has caught our attention? It's simple. COVID kills us quickly. If you get COVID you are, and you die of it, you will die of it within a few days, at most within two weeks. Whereas other global problems like climate change, climate change kills, but it doesn't kill you within two weeks. And again, it's clear that, that COVID is a cause of death. If you, if you die of COVID, it's because of COVID. Whereas if you die of the consequences of climate change, you may not recognize that it's due to climate change. So COVID is a recognizable global problem, but it's also becoming clear that it will be solved only when it's solved globally. Only when the whole world has overcome COVID will the world be safe. No one country can solve its COVID problem by itself. We've seen recently China and New Zealand and Australia and Singapore seem to have made good progress in resolving COVID within their own boundaries, but then travel from overseas just reinfected them, making it clear that this is a global problem requiring a global solution. But in a way, it's puzzling that for the first time, COVID is the global problem to wake us up to the need for global solutions, because it's not the biggest global problem. In the worst case, COVID, suppose COVID infects everybody in the world. Suppose it kills 2% of its victims. All right, in the worst case, COVID will kill 150 million people. And it's a big setback to the economy for a year or two, but only for a year or two. Whereas there are other big problems that will kill more people than 150 million and will wreck the world economy forever. What are those big global problems? Problems much more serious than the problem of COVID. Of course, there's the problem of climate change. What does climate change do? How does it hurt us? Climate change decreases agricultural production and threatens starvation. COVID is causing drought here where I am in California and many places around the world. COVID um, um, climate change is causing a spread of diseases from tropical countries to temperate countries. For example, chikungunya fever, a tropical disease of Uganda, has now shown up in Italy. Why? Because of climate change, because it's warmer in Italy, and chikungunya fever can now start thrive in, in Italy. Climate change is also causing a rise of sea level, resulting in tsunamis and threatening low-lying areas, for example, the U.S. eastern seaboard. But it's also clear that climate change cannot be solved one country at a time. Climate change is due ultimately to the production of gases, atmospheric gases from fossil fuels. But suppose the United States reduced its own CO2 production. Will that reduce CO2 levels in the atmosphere over the United States? No, of course not. CO2 over the United States depends not just on what the United States does, but on the whole world. So climate change is a global problem demanding a global solution. Another big global problem that dwarfs COVID is the problem of unsustainable resource use. We humans depend upon many resources, renewable resources that are being harvested unsustainably and at the rate we're going, we'll run out of them in a few decades. Those are resources such as fisheries, on which we depend for protein for a large fraction of the world's people. Forests that supply us with timber and paper. Topsoil is being exploited unsustainably. And fresh water, we're now exploiting something like 85% of the, the rivers of the world, the fresh water of the world. So that's a, another major problem. And then there's the world problem of inequality. Inequality between peoples of the world and inequality within countries. 
60 years ago, before globalization, it was tolerable, not moral, but rich countries could survive on a planet sustained, shared with poor countries. But now with globalization, poor countries have ways of, of sharing their unhappiness, consciously or unconsciously, with rich countries in many ways, in emerging diseases, Ebola and Marburg that emerged in certain African countries or SARS that emerged in China. Thanks to jet planes, those diseases spread around the world. That's an example of consequences of inequality of poor countries whose health systems are not capable, not rich enough to stamp out their own disease epidemics. These epidemics spread around the world with globalization. Migration, unstoppable migration nowadays between poor countries and rich countries and support for terrorists in poor countries where people are desperate and see no hope for a better life for themselves and their children. Every country has its own crazy terrorist. The United States has its, had its Timothy McVeigh. Even Switzerland and Norway had their terrorists, but there's not widespread support for terrorists in the US and Switzerland and, and in Norway, because it's not the case that everybody is desperate. But in poor countries where people are desperate, there is support for terrorists. These are then examples of global problems that are far more serious than, than COVID. My hope is that COVID, our solving the problem of COVID within the next year or two, may give us confidence from having solved one global problem, may serve as a model to us that we will be able to solve other global problems. An example is Finland, what Finland learned from solving a problem. Finland in its winter war against the Soviet Union in 19, 1939 to 1940. Finland with a population of 4 million managed to fight the Soviet Union with a population of 150 million to a standstill. And the Finns learned from that. We got through that crisis. That gives us confidence that we can tackle other crises. Similarly, if the world gets through the COVID crisis, that may give us confidence that we can tackle climate change and other crises. In the case of Finland, the Finns learned from the Winter War to be prepared. Uh, Finns today have a government organization that meets every month and thinks about everything that could go wrong in Finland and prepares for it. So of course, Finland is prepared for anything. Of course, Finland had stockpiled face masks, Finland stockpiled fuel, Finland stockpiled grain, Finland stockpiled chemicals, Finland stockpiled medicine. Finland learned from the Winter War to be prepared for anything. And so COVID may prepare us also to be prepared for anything. COVID may modify, motivate us to undertake global responses to global problems. If that is the case, then this tragedy of COVID may cause our world to change for the better. We can learn from the histories of previous crises. There are generalizations about crises. Thank you for inviting me back to Woods Hole and to the MBL and to the happy memories of 1957 for me. Thank you. Jared, uh, this is Catherine Carr thanking you on behalf of the Grass Foundation for a memorable and inspiring lecture. Um, it's part of a long tradition of, mem of memorable Forbes lectures, and you've given us a great deal to think about in, in, this, in this very difficult year and ended with some very inspiring ideas. I've been looking at the questions um, popping up on our screen, and I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Dana Mark Muniz, to moderate the questions. Thank you again very much.
All right, Dr. Diamond, if you would like to unmute yourself now and start your video, we'll start taking questions. And we'd like to welcome you to the live portion of our program tonight. There you are. Good to see you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And um, we'll jump right into the questions, if you don't mind. I'm ready. Good. Our first question for tonight one of many questions and they're continuously coming in. So we'll try to cover as many as we can this evening. Resilience is an individual level factor that can predict how well someone recovers from a crisis. What is the, nat the nation level equivalent? Furthermore, some psychologists say resilience is innate versus learned. Assuming it is innate, do you think there are more and less resilient national cultures? a good pair of questions. Uh, resilience, personal resilience, innate or learned. Um, one, one can learn from, from um, experience, uh, from experience in dealing with previous crises um, to be um, less rigid and to be prepared to deal with future crises. And similarly, nations. Finland is a good example. Um, until the winter war. Um, Finland was an unexceptional, highly agricultural, um, um, rather poor country. But from the winter war, the Finns learned that they had to be prepared to survive in isolation. And today, Finland is an example of a resilient country. Again, Japan, after the end of the Meiji era, um, um, after the arrival of Commodore Perry, um, Japan learned to become more resilient. So while there may be an innate component to resilience, resilience is also something that we as individuals, you know from experience, and that nations can learn from things that have happened. Thank you. Next question. It seems like we're constantly talking about crises, considering the climate crisis, economic crisis, viral crisis, constitutional crisis, et cetera. It seems labeling all of these and other things as crises mutes the severity of the word. At what point do you believe a problem or a challenge rises to the level of a crisis? That's a good question. Um, how serious must a crisis be to merit the term of crisis? Um, there are the small crises that happen every day. Um, there are crises that happen every few years, crises that happen a generation. For example, the history of the Roman Empire. Uh, there are Roman historians who would say the Roman Empire faced three crises, um, the end of the Republic, the barbarian invasions, da, da, da. two or three crises in the course of a thousand years. Um, on the other hand, um, a colleague of mine at UCLA studies urban crises in the United States. And by the definition that he adopts, of a drop in investment. Every two or three years, there's an urban crisis. So in short, crises are a matter of definition. There are the crises that are rare. There are the crises that happen every day. I've had a few crises so far um, um, today. Um, I tried to take a nap. I did not succeed in falling asleep. Um, I could not find where I had left my glasses. Those are minor crises. And then there are the big crises that await me over the next dozen years of my life. I hope that there will be in the next dozen years of my life. In short, crises are a matter of definition. Next question. We deal with personal crises with a lot of help from therapists like your wife. Who is the therapist for countries? Who is that external reference that can guide countries out of a crisis? Good question. There's a difference between personal crises and national crises. I mentioned at the beginning that there are differences. Nations have leaders. Individuals do not have leaders. Nations have group interactions. Individuals do not. Um, there are therapists for individuals if we choose to consult them, but there's not a therapist for nations. We're doing it by ourselves. And similarly, individuals can get help from other individuals, but we on planet Earth, um, we can't look to six-legged creatures from the Andromeda Nebula to help us. We have to figure it out ourselves.
Next question. How does the vein in American society of anti-intellectualism affect our ability to acknowledge crisis, the first step towards resolution? Are we doomed? Good question, a key question for, for the United States. And it's one of the puzzling things about the United States. The US leads the world in science and technology. And unfortunately, the US also leads major democracies in resistance to science and anti-intellectualism. It's flagrant now in the response of our national government and in the response of some states. Why should this be? Why is it that the United States world leader in, in science um, also leads the world in resistance to science. And what can overcome it? It's the responsibility of us scientists to communicate to the public and to do it as clearly as possible. There's a lot of resistance among scientists to those scientists who do want to explain things to the, to the broad public. Um, we scientists have to assume responsibility ourselves to write clearly and to talk clearly. Um, if we don't do that, the government and other people are not going to listen to us. Thank you. Our next question, after nations solve a crisis, how long does a feeling of goodwill amongst the citizens generally last? Would you predict that the US will be similar to other nations in terms of post-crisis unification? The answer to that question varies all over the map. Um, and again, from personal experience, um, you know that if you've gone through a crisis, the goodwill that you've gotten from getting through an individual crisis, um, it may be that you will then have years of smooth sailing. It may be that within a few months, you'll have another severe crisis. So in the case of the United States, um, or in the case of the world, suppose the US gets through the problem of COVID next year. Uh, does that mean that we then have smooth sailing? No. It instead means that we will then have to confront the, the serious problems. Um, unfortunately, all of us know from personal experience, if you want smooth sailing, do not live on planet Earth, find some other planet in our galaxy, because we do not have smooth sailing here. Tragedies like COVID could be a turning point for the world, but it's possible even likely fragmentation gets worse. What are inspiring global movements that we can adopt as models? It is true that, that COVID might make things worse rather than better. And there are troubling signs at the moment. For example, a vaccine will be produced somewhere, whether in China, Britain, the United States, when a vaccine is produced, will the country that produces it share the vaccine with the rest of the world? There's already talk about the country that is first with the vaccine taking selfish advantage. That would be a, a really bad sign. Uh, there is then the risk that, that COVID will increase competition. What might be the grounds for hope? COVID is going to be a potent teacher. Um, it's going to become clear, I think, that no country can solve its own COVID problem. No country will be safe until the whole world is safe. And so I hope that COVID will be a potent teacher. As a follow-up to that question, Dr. Diamond, what is a key milestone that would suggest we would be on track to address the issues that you've identified? In the case of COVID, the key milestones are well known and they are discussed um, frequently. The, the milestones that you can read about in the newspaper every day are the number of new cases of COVID, the number of deaths due to COVID. Other milestones that you can uh, learn about every day are how are people reacting? Um, are um, people voluntarily wearing face masks or are people kicking and screaming? Here in California, there are plenty of people in California who are kicking and screaming and want to go to the beaches, crowd together on the beaches, don't want to wear face masks in public. That's California, which by and large has responded well to COVID. There are other states that are responding much less well to, to COVID. Um, in short, it remains to be seen whether we are going to get our act together or whether we're going to behave badly in this COVID tragedy. Thank you. 
Another question, how does the role of propaganda and untruths play into this paradigm? In other words, is it possible for our country to learn any lessons when there is a concerted anti-science narrative being pushed, pursued by a large portion of the federal government and the media? Yes, there's a concerted anti-science narrative. And the only way that we scientists can deal with it is to adopt a more potent concerted science narrative. That is a responsibility of scientists, apropos of responsibility and disclaiming responsibility. Um, scientists, the American scientific establishment doesn't put nearly enough effort into rewarding those scientists who try to explain things to the public into promoting scientific um, uh, explanations. Um, and so the only we, way we can com combat bad propaganda is by coming up with good propaganda, by writing more interestingly, by telling the truth. We need much more of that among American scientists. Next question, inequality came up in your talk. How do you propose to end inequality in the context of crises? How do I propose to end inequality? In a democracy, the only way to end inequality is the decision on the part of people and their government to end inequality. Uh, the United States um, does poorly compared to other democracies in ending inequality. Just as an example, um, in, uh, there are parts of the United States uh, where educational levels are lower and parts where educational levels are higher. Similarly in Japan, there are, there are rural parts of Japan um, that are less well educated and there are, or there are urban parts of Japan that are better educated. The Japanese government has a policy of sending to those rural areas a higher ratio of teacher to students than in urban areas. And that tends to bring up the rural areas in Japan. In the United States, our policy is the reverse. Rural areas of the United States have a higher student to teacher ratio and a lower teacher to student, a lower teacher to student ratio than to urban areas. So the United States is failing compared to major democracies in doing things that would reduce inequality in the United States. That's a tragedy because the United States has a, a, a population of about 325 million. But of those 325 million Americans, we're educating well, what, a tenth of them, one quarter of them, and we're throwing away the potential of three quarters of Americans. Whereas we're competing with countries like Germany and Japan and other European countries that are investing in all of their citizens. Thank you. We'll take a couple more questions. I think we have time for that. Um, do you have a message for young people listening? It would seem they are our best hope for a secure future. My message to young people, my first message is to young people is vote, for heaven's sakes, vote. We have an important election coming up. The, the voter turnout, the percentage of people in an age cohort who vote, paradoxically, it's lower for young, young Americans than it is for older Americans. And that makes no sense because young Americans are the ones who are gonna live with the consequences of voting. Um, for much longer than with older America. So the first thing I would say to young Americans is vote yourself. The next thing I would say to young Americans is convince 10 of your friends to vote. The next thing I would say is get those 10 friends to convince 10 of their own friends to vote. And then on top of that, I would say um, identify causes that you care about and about which you are knowledgeable and devote some of your time and maybe even some of your money to promoting those causes. Let me see. Um, here's another question. In the absence of government leader, governmental leadership, is there a special role for universities or research institutions to mobilize disparate groups to produce rational approaches for solving national crises. Are there examples of this happening in the past? There are examples of it happening um, today. Um, 
recently the US um, um, uh, national government um, has uh, proposed to expel um, foreign students and yet foreign students have been an enrichment for foreigners in general. Immigration has been a great source of enrichment for the United States. What are universities doing about it? Well, Harvard and MIT and the University of California and other universities have announced within the last couple of days that they are suing the federal government for this bad policy. That's something that universities can do. We've received a lot of comments from attendees uh, thanking you for a brilliant, inspiring talk. Um, I wish we could take all the questions that we have on our queue, but unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time this evening. I want to thank you again on behalf of the MBL, on behalf of the 800 plus listeners that were on the Zoom call tonight, and I do hope that we can welcome you back to Woods Hole at some point in the near future so that you can um, take a stroll around Eel Pond and listen to the, the ferries depart the port. Thank you. I look forward to returning to the MBL after 63 years. Wonderful. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who were able to join us tonight. Have a good evening. <laughs>